Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Matthews. This is the second part of three parts of a pulmonary exercise physiology uh, video series. So if you haven't watched the first one, please go back and watch that first. That one I'm going to go over um, some basic anatomy and how we breathe in and out and how ventilation works and respiration works and things like that. All right, so in this one, I'm going to be talking mostly about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and essentially how we get oxygen around our body. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is uh, our attempt to explain the relationship between partial pressure of oxygen, which is what we have here on the x-axis, and the hemoglobin oxygen saturation percentage. So how saturated the hemoglobin molecules are with oxygen. And you can also convert this into how much oxygen in milliliters of, of, of oxygen are being carried around the body. All right, so if you look here, we have this S-shaped curve, also called a, a sphygmoid uh, curve, and um, we have arterial blood as this red dotted line and venous blood as this blue dotted line. And if you look at the slopes of the black curved line at each of those, the slopes are different. So this red slope is much more shallow than this blue, sh blue, than this blue slope. And that is a, a very significant thing in physiology. So basically it, how you should interpret this is this is the level of oxygen pressure around the, the lungs. And notice that the, the, again, the slope is shallow, which means the amount of oxygen that's going to come off a hemoglobin molecule in this range up here is very, very small. Um, so think of it like this. We, we have these red blood cells floating around the blood and bumping into different tissues. And from one area to the next, there might be slight variations in the pressure, pro, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen. And so going from say 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen pressure to maybe 80, which is this next one here, uh, the 80 millimeters of mercury of, of oxygen pressure, we're going to have very, very little oxygen coming off of the hemoglobin, hemoglobin molecule. So if you look over here, the difference between that is essentially maybe you know 98 and maybe 95. Uh, percent saturation. So going from 100 millimeters of mercury to 80 millimeters of mercury of oxygen partial pressure is only going to release, you know, maybe three to five percent of the oxygen from the hemoglobin. So very, very little oxygen is going to come off. And that's a good thing because when there's a lot of oxygen partial pressure, that means there's a lot of oxygen. Oxygen is plentiful in that area. It doesn't need more oxygen. So again, tissues like the lungs doesn't, and in those areas, it doesn't need more oxygen. Uh, and so we don't want a lot of oxygen coming off. But then when you start going further down this curve into lower partial pressures of oxygen, and this slope gets steeper and steeper. All right, so let's look at the same 20 millimeter difference uh, here. So uh, we'll go from 40 to 20 this time. So 40 is about what you would see in the veins at rest. So typically that's about where um, the partial pressure of oxygen would be around um, slightly active tissue. It would be lower around 20 with more active tissue. But anyway, so that same oxygen molecule when it gets to 40 has uh, about 75% or so saturation of oxygen. When it gets down to 20, now we're talking around 35% saturation of oxygen. So it went from 75% to 35%. Uh, you know, that's a difference of what, 40%? We're up here, the same 20 millimeters of difference in oxygen uh, partial pressure only got you maybe 3 to 5% off. So a very, very small oxygen amount of oxygen comes off when we're in tissues like the lungs, where it'd be high oxygen, uh, a high oxygen environment where a lot of oxygen comes off in tissues like skeletal muscle that might be active during exercise um, because they're at a lower partial pressure of oxygen. So, you know, again, three to five millimeters of, uh, three to five percent of the oxygen might come off in the lungs or in the tissues, um, you know, the aorta or whatever. Um, we're down at the level of the tissues, maybe 30 or 40 percent of the oxygen is coming off. So this shape of the curve, again, is super important because it determines 
what tissues get the pri uh, priority of the oxygen on the hemoglobin. So the tissues that already have a lot of oxygen shouldn't get a lot of oxygen because they don't need more. The tissues that don't have a lot of oxygen down here, like the skeletal muscle and other active tissues, need a lot of oxygen because they don't have a lot, and so they should get more. And that's what this curve represents. It represents the increase in oxygen that should come off to those tissues. All right, so again, it's, it's kind of an abstract thought, this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, but when you understand the concepts, Again, lungs don't need a lot of oxygen, so not a lot of oxygen comes off. Um, where skeletal muscle does need a lot of oxygen, so a lot of oxygen does come off. And this just simply explains that in sort of a mathematical uh, perspective. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, though, can be affected by uh, a multitude of things, two of which are the same things that a lot of, that, are, that affect a lot of enzymes in the body that are associated with exercise, and that is temperature and pH, so basically acidity in uh, body temperature. All right, so. As we become more acidic, what we say is that the curve is shifting to the right. All right, so meaning it goes in this direction over here. So this purple curve here would be like the blood pH during a very strenuous bout of exercise, where the black curve, the original curve, is during a less strenuous. You know, so this is around normal rest. This is heavy exercise. So you can see, again, the purple curve is slightly to the right of the black curve, and this has a benefit to us. All right, so it pushes it over to the right, which means at the same partial pressure of oxygen, we're now further down this curve, which further down the curve means a steeper slope of the curve. All right, and again, remember that slope is what uh, tells you how much oxygen is gonna come off. So at this 40 here, very little, well, not very little, some auctions coming off, but 40 on this, more auctions coming off because it's steeper. So again, if we say the difference between, we'll do maybe 10 uh, millimeter, millimeters of mercury here, so the difference between 40 and maybe 30 on this top slope would be the difference of 75 to maybe 65, 70. Where on this bottom slope, it's talk, you're talking about the difference between 60 and maybe 40. Or so, so it's a little bit more oxygen coming off. The same thing happens with temperature. So the black line is normal body temperature in degrees Celsius. The uh, reddish brownish line here is an elevated temperature, which is similar to what you'd see with a high intensity bout of exercise. So the the exercise curve with the higher temperature shifts to the right, which means a steeper slope at a given partial pressure of oxygen, so more oxygen coming off at any point in time in this, or any point in this partial pressure of oxygen uh, scale. So again, exercise is going to make you more acidic, which is going to lower your pH, it's going to make you hotter, which is going to raise your temperature. Both of these are going to promote oxygen coming off of the hemoglobin molecule and going to the active tissue, which is a good thing for exercise. All right, so we also have another molecule very similar to hemoglobin called myoglobin. All right, so hemoglobin is the molecule inside red blood cells that floats around the blood and carries oxygen around the body. Myoglobin is inside the cells of the body and it picks up oxygen just like hemoglobin and it basically moves it around inside the cell uh, providing it to areas of low oxygen inside the cell which essentially is the area right around the mitochondria. All right, so um, you can see here that the slopes though for the oxygen saturation um, for myoglobin and hemoglobin are very different. So the hemoglobin one, which is the one we've seen already, versus the myoglobin one, this orangish brown one, um, you can see that the slope is very shallow on myoglobin in the area where the venous blood oxygen would typically be. Um, so basically what that means is this steep slope means lots of oxygen coming off, right? Steeper slope of this curve means more oxygen coming off. So hemoglobin at this level of partial pressure of oxygen is going to be expelling a lot of oxygen. All right, so a lot of oxygen is coming off of it, going to 
what's around it. And what's around it is myoglobin, right? So my, it's, it's at the tissues, so the red blood cells floated down to the tissues. It's now this low oxygen area. It's letting go of its oxygen. The oxygen is going into the cells of the body, and myoglobin is picking that up because myoglobin has a very shallow slope at this partial pressure of oxygen. So it's grabbing onto that oxygen and holding onto it until it is able to float around inside the cytosol of the cell and get to somewhere where there is a much, much lower partial pressure of oxygen, and then it's going to let go of that oxygen um, here somewhere in that steep, steep part of its slope. And so that is going to occur, again, somewhere around the mitochondria where all uh, aerobic metabolism is taking place. So basically, the, the reason why we have these two different slopes for hemoglobin versus myoglobin is so that there's a handoff of oxygen from hemoglobin to myoglobin, and that then carries that and hands it off again to the mitochondria. All right, so talking about this brings up the idea of an AVO2 difference or an arterial venous oxygen difference. All right, so there's more oxygen in the arteries versus the veins in most of the arteries and veins in the body. Um, and the difference, so simple subtraction of those two is what we mean by an AVO2 difference. All right, so um, at rest here, the artery is going to carry around 20 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood. Um, once it goes through the capillaries, which is where all gas exchange takes place um, in the per peripheral system, a lot of that is going to be exchanged. And on the other side, the vein coming out of the capillaries is going to have 15 to 16 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood. So that is a difference of four to five milliliters of oxygen, so an AVO2 difference of four to five milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood. All right, so that's at rest. When we exercise, we extract a lot more oxygen out of the blood. So again, we have the same 20 milliliters of oxygen per, mil, uh, per 100 milliliters of blood at, during exercise as what it was during rest. But on the venous side, so the, the vein coming out of that, uh, App, uh, the active tissues capillary bed is only going to have around five milliliters of oxygen um, per 100 milliliters of blood. So the difference between uh, five and 20 is 15, which is much greater. So the AVO2 difference is 15 milliliters of oxygen versus at rest only four to five milliliters of oxygen. So AVO2 difference is essentially a number that quantifies um, how much oxygen is being extracted out of the blood and then used by the tissue. So the AVO2 difference is very, very low during rest, meaning very little oxygen is being extracted from the blood and used. During exercise, it's, it's much, much higher, which means a lot of blood is being extracted from the, uh, from the blood and used. So that's what AVO2 difference is, and that's how um, we use it. We need to get oxygen around the body. A body uses oxygen in bioenergetics in order to uh, fuel aerobic metabolism, but we also have CO2 that needs to get around the body. All right, so we need to expel CO2 from the cells, get it into the blood and into the lungs and expel it from the body. All right, so CO2 is going to get around the body a little bit different. Primarily is through bicarbonate, so 70% of the CO2 attaches um, into a bicarbonate pathway and gets around the blood that way. 20% bo gets bound to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin does have the ability to bind CO2, it's just not nearly as good at it as it is with oxygen. And about 10% of the CO2 just dissolves directly into the fluid, the plasma. This is only 30% adding these two up. So 70% of the CO2 that gets around the body does through the bicarbonate pathway. So basically this, that's this pathway here. So we have the exercising muscle that's producing a lot of CO2, gets into the, the blood as CO2 and H2O. All right, so that H2O came from the aerobic metabolism and electronic transport chain. And then carbonic anhydrase, which is an enzyme, is going to convert that to carbonic acid. Then carbonic acid becomes bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion, and that is going to get the CO2 around the body. So if we follow these CO2 molecules, let's just look at the green arrows here, or the green boxes, goes from there to there, goes through, becomes carbonic acid, so there's the CO2 again. It looks a little different uh, chemically, but it's still the CO2. Then it gets bound as bicarbonate here. Once it gets to the lungs, the process just reverses this. So this down here is the same as this up here, just in reverse. All right, so bicarbonate becomes carbonic acid, 
um, carrying the CO2 with it. Um, carbonic acid then becomes CO2 and H2O, carrying the CO2 out as just CO2, and then we just simply expel that CO2 out of our body when we breathe out, and it gets out into the atmosphere and gets breathed in by, well, it's sucked in by trees, and trees turn it back into oxygen, and so on and so forth. So CO2 primarily gets around the body through the bicarbonate pathway, which is this here. You can see all the green boxes where CO2 gets carried in different uh, versions of itself. We also need to get hydrogen around the body. So hydrogen is acid, all right? So we can't have too much hydrogen build up because that makes us more acidic. And as mentioned in the first part, uh, first video of this series on the pulmonary physiology, uh, the body of uh, the pulmonary system is used for getting oxygen in, CO2 out, but it's also used for maintaining the, uh, the uh, acid base uh, balance of the blood. So acid, again, being hydrogen. So we also need to deal with that hydrogen. Notice this is the exact same pathway as the previous slide. So this is still the bicarbonate pathway, but it does two things. It gets rid of CO2 and gets rid of excess uh, hydrogen. So you can see the hydrogen you can follow it along and it's going to eventually get back to the, um, the lungs and it's going to turn into water. Some of that water we absorb into the body and use as uh, plasma volume and whatever else. And some of it we just expel out um, through just respiratory uh, fluids. All right, so let's go ahead and stop uh, again right here. Um, this will be the end of part two. There's going to be a part three video. Um, for the pulmonary physiology section. Um, so please come back and watch that. That'll be the final video of this section. Um, in that, we're gonna be covering um, how our bodies adapt to exercise and how we increase ventilation with exercise and how all that's controlled and the differences between the average individual and um, elite athletes as far as how their body handles oxygen and things like that. So please come back and watch that. Um, if you have any questions about this video, you can feel free to put those in the comments section below and I'll try to get back to you. Otherwise, again, come back and watch the next video. Thanks.